Rebecca McFarland asked, let's see, I work almost exclusively in graphite and I've never taped my paper down. So I have trouble figuring out what to do with the drawing as I get towards the edge of the paper. So how do you tape off the paper when you're working and make sure that it's straight and square? Do you cut it down afterwards or leave the white border? Uh, it depends on which paper I'm using. I all I never cut the paper down. What I leave that white border because that helps me attach it to the mat later on. So I don't want to remove any of that because it it just makes it harder later on. As for making sure it's perfectly square, it doesn't really matter to me because I'm gonna, the mat's going to cover cover those edges anyway. The tape that I use just depends on what type of paper I'm using. If I'm using the Fabriano Artistica, which is nearly impossible for me to damage, that one I can use regular cheap masking tape. If I'm using something like Stonehenge, which is a bit softer, I will switch over to an artist tape so the paper doesn't tear because the artist tape is lower tack. And that is that. Okay. <laughs> Do we have any other questions that have popped up yet? There's. If you guys are watching, there's a Q&A thing on the window where it looks like you'd be able to type in your questions. But yeah, apparently, you can type in bottom right by the look of it. And that so am I muted? Up. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Hello. Lisa. Can you see me? Is it Lisa Eisenhower? Yeah. Hi. Nice to put a face to a name or a voice to a name. Voice to yeah, a name. Yeah. So can I ask a question? Yeah, ask a question. So I'm <laughs> I'm doing the rabbit today, and I am screwing around. I bought a new airbrush, and I got the um the Sparmax Dual Action one. This one here. Uh -huh. It was Hobby Lobby discontinuing it, and it was cheaper. And I thought, I'm just going to try a new one because I'm struggling with the Neo so much. But um, And it worked out great until I took it apart to clean it, and now I put it back together, and it's not working again. So it's me, not the airbrush, <laughs> which <laughs> I was hoping it wasn't going to be. But um, what am I doing? Cause let me... So what I have to do to get it to work is I have to pull the needle out. Like I take the back piece off. And then I you know what? um let me grab my airbrush and I will show you. One second. Okay. I'm gonna grab my piece. Okay, and hopefully the quality of the image here or the video you'll be able to see. But here is my gun. I unscrew the back. This backing does not need to be on the airbrush in order to work. That just makes it more comfortable. I can't see the back. I unscrew and hold it in front more. Um, you're going to unscrew this little needle back here. This is what allows you to pull the needle in and out. And mine, oh, I've got dry paint in there. Mine does not want to come out. <laughs> I'll be cleaning mine later. Um, but you're going to, you should be able to pull that out. Okay, I'm not even going to force it because mine's dirt. Apparently, I've got dry paint in mine. But you would pull that out. Your other thing would be on the tip here would come off. If you really need to clean the needle or the, the little nozzle guy, that should can come off as well. All of those pieces come out, get washed really well, and just put it back together the same way that it pulled apart. If right. it's not going back together right, it's probably just not clean all the way. I've never used the Sparmax, so I don't know, but it's probably not cleaned all the way. Well, it's, it's just like the, the Neo. It's really similar, except for this one. I have the trigger one, the Neo, and this one's got that this little nozzle on the top. Uh huh. You need to make sure that the needle is going through that nozzle. You've got to line that up. If the needle is not going through, there's a little hole in there. If the needle's not going through, it won't work. So you're just going to have to play around with. Well, so what I'm doing, there. the so to get it to work, I've got to, you see, I've to, I have to take that that back piece out. You know, like I took that cover off. And what I do is I just slide the needle back and forth. And the needle's so it, all the way forward, and then that screw needs to be really tight on the back end in order okay. to work. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? This I think is going to may take more. Email me later if we don't have this figured out. You and I will figure this out together. Sure. Right. Yeah, it's been months. Well, the viewers are going to be airbrush artists, so you and I could take forever right. making sure you've got we've got this covered, but uh, you we'll take care of you later on and make sure that we've got that set up for you. Okay. So, and if any of you guys were wondering what she's talking about with the bunny, one the group challenge for this month with Patreon was a bunny. We're focusing on this bunny and grass, and it's the grass that is our main challenge there, is painting or drawing grass. There it is so far. <laughs> <laughs> You've got green. I've got airbrushing. 
Okay, we have a question from Lori Davis over in the Q and A section asking, "How much do, how much consideration do you put into archival products in creating your art?" You mentioned masking tape, which is very much not archival. Thanks. Wait, okay, for me. I'll let you answer this too, J um, Jason, but for me, the masking tape doesn't stay. The masking tape is temporary. It comes off within a few days as soon as I'm done working. Because you're right, some of the masking tape is archival, some isn't. The artist one is, it is acid free. It also costs more. But it depends on what I'm doing. I wouldn't use masking tape to tape my work to the mat board, for example, because that would cause the paper to discolor and degrade over time. I put a lot of consideration into the archival qualities, but then there are times where like the ink tens pencils or the water soluble pencils are not going to be as light fast as colored pencil. So in that case, I've got to use a UV spray over it or frame them or and frame them behind a UV glass to make sure that they're going to last over time. But I'll, I'll use the lower quality, the things that aren't light fast, if that's my only option, if it's a medium I really want to work in and there are no other alternatives. But I take precautions with the light fast or the UV glass. How about you, yeah, Jason? Yeah, exactly the same. If it's not going to stay, I don't worry about it. But um, with the paintings, it's basically just good canvas and good quality artist paint, not student paint. So that's, that's pretty much all I would use with that. Yeah, one thing that I can say, I made a huge mistake years ago. I thought that I would save money using cheap linseed oil from the hardware store. Let me yeah. just tell you, that is not the same stuff. And it ruined everything that I painted on it. And I know I sold some of those at an art fair for like $20. They weren't expensive paintings. But I still, to this day, 15 years later, feel so guilty that I sold artwork that I later found out yellowed so badly that... And I have no way to contact these people. Not that they really care on a $20 painting, but still, it, it still drives me crazy. So, yeah, I say always use archival quality when you can. Yeah, especially if you're selling work. If you're just yeah. practicing and things like that, it's not as important. But as soon as you start selling, you don't want comebacks and things like that. So that's when you really need to up your game with the, the products you buy in. i got a couple of questions as well. Shall I shoot a few out, Lisa? Yeah, yeah. Um, Tammy Jones asks, what kind of easel do you both recommend and how do you preserve leftover oil paint for later use? You want to go first? Yeah, well, I, I just use a, a technical drawing type of easel and the reason I've got that is because it goes completely flat and it also comes up to 90 degrees. I used to use, or I've also got in the studio, an easel, a more traditional one. I think it's Maybeth is the make and that's just a, a 90 degree straight up easel. Um, as far as preserving leftover paint, I don't really preserve it, and I use an outhead so they go hard quickly anyway. But what I do, I put um, saran wrap or cling film, we call it over in the UK. I just cover the uh, palette with cling film after I use it, and I will pretty much maintain it till the next day. Or after the next day, because it's outhead oils, it's pretty much useless. It goes rock hard. Yeah. yeah. For me, my easel is an H-frame easel, and it's it adjusts. I can't work flat anyway, so I don't need an easel to lay flat because of my back. So this one sits up and is adjustable. And as far as brand, this isn't something that I think you need the most expensive of. Even the cheaper ones, as long as it's heavy weight, you're pretty much going to be okay. I see uh, different art stores have their own generic ones all the time, and they're generally fine. You just want, or I anyway, just want a heavy weight easel that's not going to slide back as I apply pressure to the canvas. For my paint, I use a palette that's called the Masters or Masters or something like that. It's basically a big, huge piece of Tupperware. Anywhere where I've mixed liquid in, that's going to dry overnight because that's a fast drying medium, just like Jason's paints that he's using. With these, though, the paints that the actual colors will stay wet for a week or two. I can just kind of puncture the seal over them and reuse the paints themselves. But it's just this big, like, you can't see my hands. This isn't working. But a big, huge palette that has a lid that seals out air. That's what I use. Yeah, I think there's one you can get with acrylics as well. It's called a Stay Wet palette. Yeah. And that's pretty much exactly what you're saying. I think it's got the enclosed lid to keep the, the air out. The thing I don't like about those for acrylic is you, you add like a wet layer yeah. and it kind of gunks up the paint weird. It changes the consistency in a way that I'm not a fan of. So I don't use those myself. I tried that. I've had students bring those in, and I just didn't like I mean, the way that you mix the paint on, I just didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. This is an interesting one. It's from Olivia Thompson, and she says, Hi, guys. I'm having a lot of problems with my oil paints beading when I'm painting over a few layers that have already dried. 
I use standard oils with M. Graham's Alkyd Medium on cotton canvases, even using just straight oil paints with no medium, sometimes beads and glazes are out of the question. Any help, much appreciated. Do you know anything about that? I've never had, the only time I've had something like that happen was when I was working with acrylic on a canvas that was badly gessoed. They had gotten oil in the gesso and so the acrylic was kind of beating up and wasn't sticking. I've never seen it happen with oil though, so I'm really not, that's a new one for me. The only time I've ever had it was when I started painting and I was using traditional oils and I was using linseed oil <laughs> as well to thin it. Now, the linseed oil was making it stay wet for a long time, and when, I, when it was dry, I'd go on top and I'd have this beading, like a, a de-wetting on the surface, and I'd have to rub it with something like liquid or something to get rid of it. So I think it's basically the oil is coming to the surface, and that's repelling the new layers going on top. But since I, all I use is just odorless thinners and alkyd oils or the M. Graham alkyd medium, I get no problems with that. So it's got to be something else. I don't think it's a canvas because it's happening on different layers. So I would say if you're using linseed oil or something like that, I would just stop that and just stick with odorless thinners and alkyd medium. And I can't see how you can get that problem then. Yeah, when it, I did see that happen when I used that cheap linseed oil I got at the hardware store. I did have that happen a little bit, but that I had all kinds of problems with it. Yeah. That stuff. We've got a question from Jill who says wants to know how to get a blurry background with Faber Castell Polychromos without water or any liquid. Don't use water. Now this one I haven't even finished the question. Don't use water at all on wax or oil based pencils. I've had people ask this I get this question quite a bit. Think back when you were in high school and you took science classes. You know what doesn't mix with water? Oil. Or wax. It won't work. Don't don't even try to mix water with it. It will not do anything beneficial for you. If you're going to add any li liquid medium or mi anything to mix with like that to blend, you want to use an odorless mineral spirit or something along those lines. Something that will blend and mix with oil and wax. But getting the blurry background without using one of those, it's going to take a lot of very, very light layers with a very light hand. Don't start burnishing until the end. Burnishing remember is adding a lot of pressure with your pencil because if you burnish you are damaging the tooth of the paper so it's too flat to take additional layers but if you layer on top of layer on top of layer very very slowly you can get that look I like it better with the paint thinner but again if you are willing and patient to do it slowly you should be able to do it just fine without you have any more questions Jason yeah I got a couple more um, Holly asks I painted a gloss varnish on my painting I'm not happy with it is there any way to change it to a matte finish by possibly repainting it with a matte varnish? Now, for me, as if it's a finishing varnish, so you've waited a, a few weeks or a couple of months and then you've varnished it with um, a spray gloss or something like that, I don't see a, a problem going over with a finishing varnish that's matte, personally. Um, it's all according on that point, really, whether or not it's, it's a finishing varnish. I only varnish with um, kind of a removable varnish, so that I've got the option to do these type of things later on. Uh, personally, I don't like the gloss varnish. It brings out the blacks better, but then you get so much light reflecting off the surface, I never use gloss. It always be matte or satin. But for me, Lisa, I, I don't know what you think. I would say there's no problem going over with a similar varnish that's now matte. I've never tried it. I would say contact the manufacturer to double check because it's gonna. There, there's so many chemicals involved, and there's just so much involved that there's no way for certain to say without knowing. I would do it on a test piece of paper or a test canvas yeah, might definitely. be a good way to go too and see what happens. But the yeah. whole nature of varnishes is that you're supposed to be able to remove them. The thing is, for me, the way I paint, I'm pretty sure if I removed one of my varnishes, it would screw up the underlying layers because I paint in such light layers. I think that I would end up scuffing and scraping some of that paint off because I do mix water in that. The varnish for me helps seal everything down so I wouldn't personally never try to remove a, a, a varnish off uh, any, I'm talking acrylic paint oil wouldn't be a big deal. I guess that would make a difference but I would say either try it on a separate canvas and see what happens before you mess up yours just in case and to contact the manufacturer because they're going to have a lot more information on that because again all of the chemicals and all that stuff I don't understand is involved in it. 
So we've got another one from Linda who says, if you're working on an acrylic painting and it dries, can you come back the next day with a mist and start where you left off? You're never going to re-wet whatever dried. If it dried, it's dry. That's it. But you can work over it and layer. I do that all the time. You guys will see me sometimes in my videos. You'll see the, the pink hair dryer pop up. I'm drying it and then reworking it. It, worst case, let's say you wanted to do wet into wet, you let it dry, but you still wanted those layers wet into wet, just paint over them. Just do another layer the next day. You can start that layer from scratch. So it's not a huge deal if you do paint over it, but you're not going to get wet into wet over something that's completely dry. It, it won't ever get wet again. We've got one from Gav who says, do you have any tips on getting past the blocking? The blocking phase. I have the same issues with oils, acrylics, and digital art, though less so with digital. I block it, let it dry, then kind of lose the motivation to carry on somehow. The canvas being blocked in gives me more artist block, no pun intended, than a blank white canvas. That, it's so funny. That's backwards for me. That's the, the blank white canvas is my least favorite part. Once I get everything blocked in, then I have fun. That's just going to be personal preference and personal experience one thing that I do when I kind of when I'm just like I don't want to work on this anymore I want to go play video games or do anything but art right now when I get to that point I put in an audiobook and listen to that and focus on the book and just kind of go into like auto drive on the painting or drawing just to get through it so I don't know how much more to help besides that I had something similar Gav um, when I started out oil painting the blocking in stage was quite exciting because things grew really fast on there and you got the animal down or whatever you're painting really fast so you kept your motivation. Because I was using standard oils I then had to wait depending on the colors four, five, six days before I could do another layer. By that time I'd thought about a different painting and I couldn't be bothered with the one that I'd already started and that was the reason why I searched out then faster drying mediums like liquid and then subsequently I went on to alkyd medium so I didn't have to buy liquid at all and that gave gave me the opportunity then to just get on with it the next morning and start painting again and then when you've got that snowball it's you know it's keep going like that then you can get to the finished painting but that delay in the art process that used to do exactly the same with me and that would put me off the painting then I had to stay quite rigid and make sure I didn't leave a painting unfinished because I knew if I was going to start that with one of them then I'd have two unfinished, three unfinished and I'd never get paintings finished. Also a good motivating part as well, if ever I don't feel like painting I'll go and check my bank balance and that motivates me <laughs> to pick my brushes back up again pretty quick. <laughs> Funny how that works, isn't it? It does seem to work. But I think Gav, if, I know you're using liquid but um, if you can try and get your paintings to dry by the next morning and then keep the motivation going, that, that's how I get past the blocking in stage. Yeah, I had to stop. I have paintings actually that I'm going to end up going and throwing away because we're going to be moving soon. But I have paintings that I started 10 years ago and I would do that. I'd lose interest and be like, okay, I'll come back to this. I want to work on this now instead, something else. And I never went back to them. So I have kind of a personal rule right now. Unless it's an issue of I need to let something dry so I'll work on something else at the same time, I don't allow myself to, to work on anything else until that painting or drawing is finished. So let's see. I've got a question from Kathleen Morrow asking, how, how about how to decide which art projector to purchase for enlarging or reducing images? Can you compare the different ones and discuss which ones you guys use? For me, I'm pretty basic. I have a cheap, uh, it's an art trace, I think it's called Art Tracer, something like that. It is. I want to say it's about $80 at most of the art stores here in the US. It's very inexpensive. It doesn't give you tons of detail, but it'll give you your general outline, but it is not a good one. I did get a more expensive one, and I didn't find the one that I had purchased to be any better, so I ended up returning it. But for me, more often than not, I don't even use my projector anymore. Uh, if I'm going to trace something, I just trace it from my monitor. Yeah, I don't use a projector. Um, I showed a YouTube video a while ago showing that that was one opportunity or one way you could use to actually um, trace some things like that. I borrowed my wife's works one so that didn't cost me anything at all but basically they're just going to be used for the outline so I would say all of them just about is going to allow you to have enough detail for the outline. The main difference with the more expensive ones is the brightness of the bulb inside especially if you're going to watch video and things like that so you haven't got to have the room completely blacked out so 
a cheaper one would do. In the UK, we got things called copy cake. I don't know if you got them over there. And that's a projector where you can even put a, a, just a small 6x4 photograph in there. But I know that even those are a couple of hundred pounds. So if it's just for getting the outline, I just say look on Amazon or somewhere like that and just look for the cheaper ones, really, for the outline. Yeah, and you, it'll tell you on the box or on the, the listing how big it's going to enlarge. So be aware of that because it, it will depend on how big you want. Usually the bigger it gets, the more distortion you get in the projector. And that's one reason I like to use just trace straight from the, the computer screen. I'm avoiding any of that distortion. Any distortion I have was from the original photograph, not from the, the way the projector kind of spreads the image out because it's coming from a small location. Working smaller with the projector works good, but again, then I'm just it's easier to use the trace from my monitor. So I've got a question from, oh, this is a good one, Artifacts 23. Say you were painting an animal portrait working as realistically as possible. Would it be okay for the main focus on the eyes head area to be very detailed and the rest out of focus bits? Say from the neck down, not as detailed. Or should you keep deta it detailed all over? I always struggle with this. Is there an artistically correct way? Thanks for this brilliant idea and your time. Oh, you want to go first, Jason? Yeah, okay. Um, there's no hard and set rule. It, it's all according if you're selling the painting or looking to sell the painting. From my research, because I need to sell paintings, I need to kind of work out the formula of what people like to buy. They like to make eye contact with the animal. They like the eyes to be in focus, high contrast and things like that. If you're not selling it, do exactly as you want. I almost always reduce the fo reduce the sharpness of the image away from the face on especially on portraits that makes it in my opinion more interesting for the viewer to look at the animal because if everything is in focus it can be a bit overpowering and a little bit too photorealistic so um, personally I'm trying to loosen up brushwork all the time as well because realism other than hyper realism which is really everything really photographic, if you're looking at realism, it's generally more to do with the tones and the colors than the detail, in my opinion. I've seen the best paintings I've ever seen are usually not that detailed. So, but yeah, I would definitely, if you're going to detail it, make sure the eyes in general and the face is in detail and then kind of reduce the detail elsewhere in the painting. The nice thing is, you can do it that way where it what am I hearing? You can do it that way where you've got the tons of detail on the eyes and less so on the rest of the portrait. If once it's done, take a photo of it, step back, whatever you need to do. If it doesn't look good, then you can go back and add more detail. So I think it would be better to add less to start with and just keep building up as you decide the painting needs it. But there's no rule. Really with art, I don't think there's really any rule either way. I mean, you will find people who like who prefer one over another and it just depends on your, your target audience. Yeah, most of the rules actually, I find, stop people painting and stop them starting completely because they get so confused and worried about breaking a rule or doing a, a painting where the fat over lean is not exactly right. They think it's going to fall apart within a year and they never even get to paint. And yeah. that's when they just learn to paint. They're not even thinking of selling. So, without a doubt, don't worry too much about all the rules, the so called rules. Yeah, I actually had one, a question, speaking of fat over lean, from, where did it go? This is from Cindy. She asked, I'm trying to skip through the rest of the email. Um, let's see. Yeah, she, that's simple enough. She just wants some explanation about fat over lean. So um, for the way that I look at it, just simply put, now I'm using liquid to blend. So, and I do such thin layers that I don't even really need to consider fat over lean. It doesn't matter to me because every single one of my layers is so thin. If the reason that that whole rule exists is that if you put really thick paint down, the thin layers are going to dry faster because the thin layers are either thinned with something like liquid or your mixing medium or paint thinner or whatever it is that you're using to thin your paint with. If you have thick paint, the oil paint other than, I think the alkalids 
technically dry. I know when using liquid, it technically dries. The other paints, it more cures than dries. And so when you put something really thin on top, as the thicker paint underneath slowly dries, it can cause cracking because the top stuff on top had dried so fast, it kind of pulls everything out. It's just a big old mess. So that's why you don't want to put thin paint or paint that's been thinned down on top of thick paint. But if you're doing like how I do, I, every one of my layers is thin. It's not something I ever even have to consider. But if I did want to paint heavy, I need those heavier brush strokes. So that, that heavier paint has to go towards the end of the painting, not the beginning. But it's not as dip, it's not as complicated as people make it sound to be. Yeah, with liquids, they kind of like a half stop between acrylics and oils really as far as dry and as far as I'm concerned and it really dries you know thoroughly after a couple of days it's really really dry so I, I really don't worry about this whatsoever just naturally you find the first layers are usually thinned with thinners to get the the blocking in and the base coat down and then naturally you're adding things like liquid or medium for the next layer so they have got more fat in them so as long as you're following that type of thing and you're not but but then even people you know they say about this fat over lean and it comes up all the time I know artists that are selling paintings for thousands of pounds and they're world-famous wildlife artists and they follow the fat over lean right and then when they finish in the tiger off for instance and they got to do the whiskers they thin it really finely with thinners and they stick it over the fat parts they painted. Now as far as I know none of the tiger's whiskers have ever fell off after a couple of years. So I don't even know if this principle even works to be I honest because it, everyone breaks it. Yeah I think it would be a bigger issue if you were painting like the Bob Ross style where you were using a palette knife for your mountains and then yeah. decide to glaze a tint over it because you're putting a glaze over the entire mountain. I could see that being a bigger issue but yeah like the little details like that I've never seen anyone have problems with. So, let's see. Do you have more question, questions? Questions, Jason? Yeah, I've got a quick one from Kathy Miller. I have a terrible time mixing the right colors. I can see the colors I want, but can't figure out how to create them. Do you want me to go first? Or go you? for it. I just break this down really simply. It's what I learned when I started painting, and it's exactly what I do now. If you get confused, get a round piece of paper and put an R for red, a B for blue, a Y for yellow on there and then in between the colors that would create to be mixed so red and blue is purple, red and yellow is orange, blue and yellow is green so then if I'm looking at something like a red apple but it's not quite red right I look at the apple I say what's the primary color what's the main color that I've got on my palette that's closest to the red apple so it could be wins are red. I'll look at that and then I'll say how does that differ from the apple that I'm trying to create and if it's a, a greeny red or a, something like that then I look at complementary colors because the problem people usually find is they don't know how to gray the color so they've got this really vibrant red and they want to make it subdued they need, usually need to add the complementary which would be like a green but it's, it's something you can't really answer really quickly on a on a something like this. But but that's my thoughts. You know, look for the main color first, and then look at the color twist or, or you know where it's actually going to. Is it going to the blue side or the yellow side and things like that? And usually, don't try to lighten a color with white. That's where people lose it as well. So if you want red and you're trying to re lighten the red you usually would lighten it with a yellow and that will still keep that ready look to it whereas if you go white with it it'll start to go pink so I don't know if you can explain that much easier than that Lisa I've got a trick that I use and I have an old video doing it but I can actually show my computer screen and I'll show you guys right now what I do when I'm matching color I have this next to me especially when I'm working in colored pencil um, where is the little screen share there we go Okay, so you guys, can you see my Photoshop on there? Yep. Okay, yep. so what I do, let's go ahead and open a new file, and I will open the leopard that I'm currently working on. Um, sure, you. So working on this leopard, when I'm trying to figure out what color I need in the face, like there's a lot of blue in by his eyes, I can actually add a separate layer onto my little blank thing, go solid color. Now I've got this eyedropper tool. I can go and point anywhere 
like if I want to see what color that brownish color was. I can now come over here and see how much gray, how bright is this? I mean, you can see based on the color scale that I'm closer to orange yellow than the upper red section. I, it just it gives me a little bit more guidance. It's not going to be perfect, but it makes it a little easier to see what I'm going to need. Like in this case, if I were to mix this with acrylics, I would add a touch of black and white in with I have a I want to say it's burnt sienna or raw sienna, and that would give me that color. I can see that I need a grayish tone, and then what Jason was saying with adding complementary colors, that would be another thing. If I was too red, I could add a bit of green, add the complementary color. But using Photoshop like this makes it so easy for me to tell what colors I need in there. Like I did not realize that that was such a green-gray color. I saw more yellow in the eye. But doing this, I can see how it's more gray, like way more gray than it is green or yellow. So that's my little trick on making it easier to figure out what colors I need to blend. Yeah, I, I do exactly the same with the eyedropper. I've got it on one of my um, e-books. And one, th one problem I found with that eyedropper when I was starting off with it is that it was picking up just like a single or a triple pixel. And so it was not showing me the true color all the time because it was picking up that single pixel. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's a way to adjust it. But what I did was actually blur the photo with a Gaussian blur. And that just generally shows you all the blocks of main colors, and that really, you know, sorts that out. But is there a way, Lisa, do you know of stopping it doing that single pixel picking? I don't worry about it. It's close enough for me. I usually hit the dropper on a few areas around there to get an idea yeah. of what it would adjust to. I just do it really quickly. Yeah, I was finding it problems with, say, you're looking at tiger fur, and there's dark areas and really, really light areas, yeah. individual haze, and that's where I did the blur in. But, um, yeah, the... the the actual thought process of mixing the colors, that's where the complementary ones come in. Yeah, and that's huge. It's something that I see a lot with students. They end up with things that are like just fluorescent green when they really want an olive green. Add red. That just that will pretty much solve your problem. Add its complementary color and see how that works for you. So do you have more questions while I look up where um, we're There's a quick one from Cindy. What would I rather? What would you rather have? A bad canvas or bad paint? <laughs> Neither. I refuse to work with either. Yeah, because if you're going to spend hours and hours, or sometimes weeks, on a painting, but saying that, if I had a bad canvas, I could cover it with good quality gesso. Um, you know, you could even do oil paintings on newspapers if you put, you know, good quality gesso or something on there and things like that. It's not going to literally fall apart so but if you've got bad paints or cheap paints there's no way back from cheap paints. See and I've had problems with canvas the Hobby Lobby's brand is one that I was recently using and it was just so I had so many problems with warping stretchy now you don't work on stretcher bars usually because no. of shipping but for me I do and I can't tell you how many paintings are hanging on my wall right now that are completely warped because of bad stretcher bars and so right. I spent two weeks working on one of these paintings and why because now I well I could put it on new stretcher bars but that's going to cost that much more money in which case I would have saved a whole lot of money if I just got a quality canvas to begin with the other thing is that a lot of these gessos depending on the canvas itself, a good canvas, the gesso kind of melds in with the fibers of the canvas, like Frederick's. They mix together, so that gesso is never going to come off. If it is a bad canvas, if it has bad gesso on it, even adding additional gesso can eventually, those two layers of gesso can eventually separate from each other. It depends on how bad the canvas is, but for me, I don't even chance it. I just always stick with Frederick's and then I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I think these days canvas and paints are such a reasonable price that you never need to go for the real cheap stuff anyway, to be honest. And if you yeah. think, well, I'll get student quality or I'll get real cheap paint while I'm learning, you're just setting yourself up for disaster because it's much, much more difficult to learn when you're using cheap paints, especially things like watercolor paints. They just don't work at all, the cheap ones. Yeah, if you're fighting your materials, you're not really learning that much because you're spending more time trying to make something work the way it's supposed to. That's true with colored pencil. I found it especially true with acrylic paint. Because a cheap paint, you'll put the first layer down, it'll dry completely. You put the next layer on top for glazing, and the first layer will lift right off. I mean, they're horrible. They don't blend well. They don't mix well. There's a lot of problems with using cheap canvas or paint, so I won't use either. Awkward silence. Let's see, I've got a question from Louise Gray. I don't think we answered this last time. She said she's having a lot of problems incorporating yellow into her skies with blues in acrylics. 
I had once mentioned to go from glue, blue to purple to yellow. She's not sure how that would be done. Literally how it sounds. You're probably overthinking this. It's literally, I have blue paint, like, a, let's say I have a yellow sunset. I need that yellow to fade up to the darker blue in the sky. I'm going to do the yellow, then I'm going to mix it into, fade it into purple, and then I'm going to fade the purple into blue. So I've got this transition, so it's not just one straight onto the other. We might have answered this last time. I don't remember. So that's, it's pretty probably way more simple than you're thinking. I got a quick one from Caroline. Um, she says for both of us, um, she's not sure what we mean when we say blocking in the paint in our videos. Could we explain it? Um, could the question be about one of our paintings that could need advice? So I'm not sure if that's on your uh, area, Lisa, but uh, basically for me blocking in just means um, you're not looking at the detail, you're just looking at the very basic parts, the very basic colors and tones. What I normally always do when I'm looking at my reference, when I'm starting to block in, I squint my eyes. If you've got really, really bad eyesight, take your glasses off and then that will automatically just reduce all the detail and blocking in just means just painting in the very basic under colors, you know, the, take all the detail away. If you go Photoshop or something like that, if you blur your photograph, that's what you're trying to achieve, or I am when I'm doing a blocking in. It's as simple as that. Yeah, that's pretty much the same as it's it just getting solid. Think of it like a good outline, the drawing is accurate, but if a five year old had control to keep inside the lines, that's what my underpainting is going to look like, or blocking in the color. It's just exactly what Jason said, putting it in a pro, you know, the approximate color where it goes. But for me, for a lot of the layering too, it doesn't even necessarily need to be the color that's going to end up being there. I'm looking through my files to see if I've got a sam like an progress one where I can show you what the blocked in layer would look like. I'm having a hard time finding it. None of these are showing any of my step by step. You'll see those beginning layers where there isn't a lot of detail. That's the what we're talking about with blocking in. So let's see. What other questions do you guys have for us? We've got another one from Jill. Do you think that the color block gives you color black gives you a less realistic look? You know, this is something that is like such a hot topic with so many artists who are there are artists who think never use black, it's horrible. I love black. If I want something black, I want it really black. That said, when I use black, I will usually glaze a second color on top, a dark blue, a purple, something else on top of it so that it's not flat, flat black, and that gives me the depth that I want. But I personally love using the color black in my painting. A lot of artists hate it. That's going to come down to what you like, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it as long as you're not leaving it straight black. Yeah, this is another one of those rules, so-called rules, don't have black on your canvas, don't have things like that. I use black as well. Um, sometimes there's areas where just mix in the, the, the old standby, the traditional ultramarine blue and burnt umber for, for your black. It just doesn't go black enough. Mm -hmm. Sometimes around the cat's eyes and things like that where it's really, really dark, then I'll use black. But 99% of the time I will also tint that color somehow by mixing something else in with it. Yeah. But there's, there's plenty and plenty of really brilliant artists out there that use black out of the tube, definitely. Yeah, and really that's it. Look at some, Figure out who your favorite artists are. What, what is the style that you're going for? If an artist that you like is using black, then obviously it's going to be okay for your style if that's what you're kind of working towards. Any more questions for us, guys? Or do you have any more, Jason? I'm not seeing any more on the... I was reading old ones from last time. I think I got them. Uh, I got one from Jack Snowden. It's a pencil-related question. And it's, when you start, how do you color the background before you do the pencil work? For a colored yeah. pencil? Must be, yeah. So when you start, how do you color the background before you do the pencil work? Perhaps has to do with your airbrushing, perhaps? Yeah, it's possible. What, the way that I do it, and I actually have a video coming out on Saturday that shows you exactly how I use Frisket and, and uh, word just left me. Um, masking fluid, that was really hard to think of right there. <laughs> the way that I use 
masking fluid and brisket and how I apply that. I have a video that will show you step by step how to do it. But what I do, I want to block in, block out my subjects. I don't want airbrush paint on there because colored pencil, some of them are opaque, but not opaque enough that if I color a lot with, if the airbrush gets where I don't want it, it's going to be hard to cover it up. So I just use masking fluid around the edge of my subject, and then I use a piece of brisket over the center. Masking fluid being as wet as it is, some papers it will warp quite a bit. They'll usually be able to get back into shape, but I'd rather not fight with it. So I just put it around the edge to avoid too bad with the warping, and use brisket, which is something typically used by artists for airbrushing. I just cut that out the size of the inside of my subject and smack them in there. And the reason that I do the the masking fluid first and not just brisket for the whole thing is the masking fluid can be painted on so I have a little bit more control of my edges versus having to sit there with scissors and get a perfectly accurate line for the masking or the brisket. I'm mixing up all of those words now. This is too early for me. But the video will explain it better. I got another one from Kathy and that's um, when working on a sketch she says she don't know when to, to basically what I read is she's putting in so much detail she doesn't know when to actually stop with the detail because she doesn't want to lose the detail and she's getting mixed up. So she's asking when she's doing a sketch, um, how do you know basically when enough is enough? Now for me, if you're doing a painting, I put in the bay minimum generally and that would be just the outline. I put in where the eyes are. If there's a lion, that's it. If it's something like a leopard, then I'll draw the circles for the spots because they're kind of pretty critical. Not not that they've got to be the right shape, but they've got to actually follow the contours of the body to make the actual shape work. But I found the more I paint, the less I'm putting into my drawings for detail. I get, you get more confident, and then you just actually put in basic outlines because you know all of it's going to be covered up anyway. So don't be too um, particular unless you're actually doing a finished drawing. Yeah, it's pretty much the same for me. And this is where it comes in where people ask if it's okay to trace. You still have to know how to draw. If you can't, you're not going to draw every single detail in there. You have to be able to freehand that in later. The tracing the outline, that just is a time saver. But the amount of detail you want, it's going to depend on how you work. When I work in colored pencil, I will put a ton of lines in there just to make it easier for me. But you're right, it can make it to where it's harder to know your place. So that's where your freehanding skills are going to come in in figuring out how to draw stuff. So, yeah, I'm with Jason on that. I, you know, you don't need all of that little teeny tiny detail. But the more that you do it, the more you're going to know what's going to be useful for you and what isn't going to help. We've got another question from Lisa Eisenhower asking, are there any other acrylic paint brands in Hobby Lobby that you would use besides Liquitex? Sometimes there are sales that I don't know if I want to take advantage of. You don't. The sales that you're seeing, it's the Masters, and that is hot. I shouldn't bash them because I actually like Hobby Lobby, but it's their generic brand. I do not recommend using art supply stores generic brands of paint. I will use their generic paintbrushes. I love their paintbrushes, but not the paint. The only ones that go on sale now at Hobby Lobby are their generic paints, which they're not the same as Liquitex Basics. They look the same in the tube, but they have a really high gloss. So the way that I layer and need to use the white charcoal pencil to draw out my subject, I can't do that with that paint. I have a couple of students who have used those and they're just I don't like them at all I don't recommend them I would definitely stick with the Liquitex um, as far as what they carry there you have any more Jason yeah I got another quick one from Melanie and she says who is your number one motivation beside yourself and your fans no matter how much I tell myself to paint I still don't for me YouTube has made all the difference in the world. I used to paint, I used to, you know, I'd post everything on Facebook and then I'd go play World of Warcraft way too much. I was more interested in that. I have a bit of an addictive personality. You should have seen how many months or years really that I only would eat frozen taquitos from Walmart. But I, I had a hard time getting myself to paint. I just didn't have the motivation for it. So I know exactly what you're talking about. For me with YouTube, I set a schedule. I said every Wednesday I'm going to upload a video, which meant every week I had to have a new painting and drawing done. There's no reason I couldn't finish that, but it meant because I committed to that schedule that I had to paint whether or not I had motivation or was in the mood or not because if I didn't, I let down that that commit that promise that I made to have a video every week. I felt like I was failing that. So for me, setting a schedule and 
sticking to that schedule is what did it for me. Because trust me, I don't want to paint every day. There are days I would so much rather play, like right now, Final Fantasy. But I can't because I have a schedule to keep to. So for me, I would recommend the schedule. I mean, I have motivation as far as, you know, my mom is amazing. My husband's great. Well, my husband just wants me to get paid. But... You know, I do have people who motivate me, but really, none of that matters if I'm not willing to keep to a schedule. So setting that schedule is what did it for me. Yeah, this kind of comes down to, is this a hobby or is this a profession? When it's a profession, then you've got, you've got to earn money or you're going back to a regular job, you know? If it's a hobby, that's when it can be even harder because if you don't paint, it's not the end of the world. You're probably still going to eat and things like that. If it's a profession, and like Lisa said, a schedule, and you can do things like that, that's great. If it's a hobby, I think if you if you can commit to yourself and say every day or every two days or whatever it's going to be, say three days, but make sure on that third day you're definitely going to pick up the brushes, you're definitely going to paint for whatever time, say five minutes, ten minutes, and just promise yourself I'm going to do it. Unless there's some big catastrophe, every third day you're going to paint for 10 minutes and I guarantee when you put the paints out and you start you will not stop at 10 minutes you know what it's like when you're painting hours just fly by and you know you'll be, you'll be painting I think the problem is if it's a hobby it's actually just making that first you know effort to, to do it it's all too easy now to just sit down in front of the TV and watch TV Everybody says they haven't got no time, but we've all got a probably four or five hours every evening just watching TV, doing nothing. You know, so there is probably time there, and it's just making that schedule, that initial commitment, and then saying to yourself, I'm going to finish every painting I start, whether it's rubbish or not, I'm going to take it all the way through to completion, and then forget about it, move on, you know, and, and keep going like that, and that's how to improve. The more, funnily enough, you know, you get really lucky about producing really good paintings when you put more effort into it. The more effort you put in, the easier it seems to get, and they just go hand in hand. So, you know, really start to get yourself a schedule and say every day, every day is the best. If you can do it every day, you see lots of artists do this paint in a day, and the reason they do it is because they know if they do a paint in a day, in a hundred days, they're going to be substantially better than they was on day one. It's got to happen no matter what. So let that be your motivation and just go with that. Yeah, and if you're kind of thinking, I don't want to set a schedule that's, um, I know I was. I was like, I don't have time for a schedule. I don't want to commit to that. I'd have less time, less free time if I have a schedule. Having that schedule allowed me so much extra time. Well, I mean, I don't have a ton of extra time because I'm busy all the time. But, I mean, I was able to fit more into a day in having that schedule. So whether it be scheduling time to paint for me, scheduling time to edit video, everything that I do is scheduled pretty, I mean, it, it's pretty down to the, the minute there, but I'm able to get so much more done, and I really do find that I have more free time now that I didn't have before. So the, the word schedule, I know for so many of us, is a bit scary, but it really does make a difference. Yeah, perhaps the, sh the schedule actually makes you not waste time. Yeah. So you're not on, you know, you're not browsing the internet, you're not browsing Facebook, you're not just watching TV and things like that, you know, until you've done your work day, and then you, you can relax then because you know you've done your job, and then this is your free time. And if you want to sit on the sofa and just look out the window, you can do it and you feel okay about it because you've done your day's work. Yeah, and that made a big difference for me because working from home, I found that I felt like I always had to work. And now I have my schedule the way it is this week. It could change any time, but for quite a few months now, by midnight, I'm done working. Midnight, I stop everything. I go take my bath. I go, you know, relax for a while, feed my dogs, go on a walk, whatever I want to do. But midnight, that's it. I'm done working. But setting that, may, I, I have two extra hours now where it's just kind of wind down. Wind, I can't talk wind down time that I didn't used to have before I set that schedule. So we have Jill. You asked about the how we ship a painting when we're sending it far and protecting and insuring it. We actually talked a lot about that on the last one, so and we're actually running up on our, the end of our time, so I won't go too far into it, but there, actually I should probably just find the link for you um, from the last one. We'll for me it was just send it in a tube because I don't use stretcher bars because it's just so much hassle shipping abroad with stretcher bars. That was yeah. That was my input with that.
Yeah, and that's what I've had to do. Like when I sent something to Australia, I had to let the buyer know I can send it to you, but I've got to remove it from the stretcher bars because it was going to cost. I think she paid like four hundred for the painting, and it would have been four hundred and fifty for shipping if I included the stretcher bars. It was only I want to say it was twenty five or thirty five dollars. It was something like that. I don't remember exactly to ship it in a tube. So that was way cheaper. But as far as insuring it, when you insure it. Internationally, you can't in most cases. Within the U.S., if I insure something, all I'm insuring is that it doesn't get lost. If they lose it, they'll cover that. But if it gets damaged, the insurance doesn't cover that at all, whether it be UPS, USPS, all of that. So that's a whole, you're, every time we're shipping a painting, we're taking a risk, no matter whether we insure it or not. Yep, that's the same in the U.K. as well. I got a very quick one from Tammy. May not be a quick answer, though. What was the best tip or shortcut you learned and who shared it with you? And at the moment, I can't think of anything. Mine was from Jaime Jimenez. You guys have heard me talk about him before. He did a lot of the background stuff for, like, I want to say it was the second or third Star Wars movie. He did a lot of movie stuff. He lived at Lucas Ranch for a while. Amazing artist. But he worked in the building that I did when I worked at an animal hospital. He worked in the back bagging dog food for whatever company, I forget the company name, but he, for our lunch breaks, we always hung out and talk about, talked about art, and he brought in my first airbrush, it's just a single action airbrush, and he demonstrated how to paint wet into wet. I had no idea. We had been at a gallery the week before, and I was saying, oh, I really like that style, and he said, oh, that's wet into wet. I wasn't currently, I had no idea how to do that with acrylics at the time. So he came in and did that demonstration for me, like a little 10 minute demonstration. It completely changed, I mean day and night changed my work. I will never not be grateful for that moment. Yeah, um, the best shortcut I found really was, that changed my art was when I moved over to Alkids or when I discovered Liquid. That was a game changer. That meant that paintings that would take me two months would then take me a week. So that was massive. Um, and you know what? I think that the the person I'm learning most from at the moment, I don't know if you've heard, well, you've heard of him. You wouldn't have heard of his name probably, but you know what he's done. Lisa knows him. Aaron Blaze. And he's the guy behind Brother Bay and things like that. Animation. And he Lion is King. absolutely, yeah, Lion King, absolutely fantastic. You can learn so much from these guys because they've really got to create depth in their paintings and things like that and they're really working on lighting effect so it's not just about painting a tiger for instance he's really superb again the lighting just spot on and things like that so he's got a brilliant YouTube channel as well Aaron Blaze and it's really worth checking out because you learn something most of his art is Photoshop but he does do other things as well he does a lot of graphite He's, you know, I've seen his stuff and I went out and bought some graphite straight away because I thought I've got to have a go of that and some charcoal I bought straight away so he's spending my money like, <laughs> like I spend Lisa's money as well. <laughs> yeah, so, but, you know, just, you know, you can learn all the time from different people and learning from these animation guys and cartoon guys, they are really brilliant on light and another one is... Um, the guy behind Dinotopia, James Gurney, and he's got another brilliant channel, and he really works with light and things like that, and that's what painting's all about, really. When you when you move up a level, that's what it's all about. Yeah, if you can get that light and contrast in there, it's amazing. And so, yeah, you're right. Aaron Blaze, oh my gosh, I love his stuff. But any of those animators, they just have mastered getting a realistic look very simply. So it looks like we are right towards the end, unless you have any more questions you want to fit in real quick. That was the last one from me, Lisa, anyway. Yeah, I think we are good. Um, what do we have from... We'll do Lisa's really quick. I just recently posted my Patreon challenge on the Facebook page where I only have 40 friends. I'm not sure I understand your question, Lisa. So I just recently posted my Patreon challenge on my Facebook page where I only have 40 friends, college friends and family. What is the appropriate way to post paintings on there? It would make would it make it seem more professional to post canvas type, medium. Oh, okay, I understand your question. What to what to include with your post? Yeah, like I put the reference photo source, and I didn't know if I should put like that it came through Patreon, like like put your reference you, and then talk about this one. The, the leopard was in oils done on Frederick's blue canvas, and it depends on your audience. I think you need to consider who your target audience is. If you have 
care about that sort of thing. So I always include, I do think you should always include where the reference photo came from. Because crediting the photographer or if, like with me, I buy from wildlife reference photo all the time or I use Jason Morgan stuff. I want to make sure they get credit for where that came from so people know where they can get it too. But other than that, if I'm posting in an art group, they're going to be interested in what supplies that I use. Otherwise, if it's your friends, they're going to be more interested in how long did it take you or did you paint this for your living room? I mean, this sort of thing that it, you've just got to consider your target or who your audience is where you're posting it, I think. Yeah. And then should I be referencing you? Like when I do the, when I'm, like all my art right now are your Patreon challenges, basically. You can. Most of those photos came from morgue file or like the bunny was my own photo. So you can reference me as the photographer. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think most of you, like if you're college friends and family, probably aren't going to care. Yeah, I just don't know if it was being respectful to you in terms of giving, you know, acknowledging you as the source of where I even got. No, it's oh, not I the official it for Sure, it's not required, but I definitely appreciate it. Okay. So I think that is about it for today. Um, we will definitely plan more in the future, and I think I'm getting to where I understand how Google. Hangouts is working a little bit better. We had the question and answer this time, so we are one step up from last time. Mm -mm. So thanks for joining us, guys, and thank you, Jason, for doing this with me. And these videos will be up on YouTube later on both of our channels. So I guess that's it. Bye. bye, bye. We're not bye. to have an outro saying bye to you guys, but I will see you on <laughs> Saturday for the social media vlog. And then on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram in the meantime. Bye, guys.